The most important, yet often the most boring step, is the part where I have to discuss where I'm pulling this information from exactly. Cultural analysis is actually pretty easy to manage, and is usually done through sociological methods like surveys, experiments, field studies, and so on. How I pulled my data for this video is a combination of a survey I conducted, statistics related to the industry, and also analyzing the discourse present in gaming circles, including common terminology, arguments, and positions put forth by gaming fans. Before I get to the major points I want to make about gaming culture, I first want to have a rundown of a lot of the underlying theory that goes into understanding male-dominated societies and subcultures. I want to discuss how exactly it is that a space becomes male-dominated to begin with. For the purposes of this video, I looked into academic papers and articles discussing gender norms in social spaces, as well as the theory behind how gender norms reproduce themselves in such a way that consistently privileges men. I also was lent two books that I've pulled articles and quotes from for the sake of this video, so thanks to my professor for helping me out, it's greatly appreciated. The first book, The Kaleidoscope of Gender, is what I'll be pulling from quite a bit. Reading 32, Gendered Organizations in the New Economy, talks about how workplaces and industries favor men over women. At both the top and bottom of the employment pyramid, women continue to lag behind men in terms of pay and authority, despite closing gender gaps in educational attainment and workplace seniority. What accounts for these persistent gender disparities? Gender inequality is tenacious because it is built into the structure of work organizations. Even the very definition of a job contains an implicit preference for male workers. Employers prefer to hire people who can loyally devote themselves to the organization. This preference excludes many women, given the likelihood that they hold primary care responsibilities for family members. Consequently, for many employers, the ideal worker is a man. Organizations supposedly use logical principles to develop job descriptions and determine pay rates. Managers often draw on gender stereotypes when undertaking these tasks, privileging qualities associated with men and masculinity that then become reified in organizational hierarchies. Through organizational logic, therefore, gender discourses are embedded in organizations, and gender inequality at work results. What these quotes illustrate is that the way that hiring decisions are made are in a manner that privileges men by idealizing the workers that they want to hire in ways that are coded as masculine. Examples could include having to make tough calls, which is something that favors men because women are stereotyped as being overly emotional and thus are automatically seen as less likely to make tough calls even if we're perfectly capable of doing so. The obvious counterpoint to these ideas is going to be that masculinity is simply better for the job, or that men aren't actually privileged and that it's just conjecture. But I have another study, this one a study conducted on trans men in the workplace, and how their experiences with gender in the workplace were shaped by coming out and transitioning. Sociological research on the workplace reveals a complex relationship between the gender of an employee and that employee's opportunities for advancement in both authority and pay. While white-collar men and women with equal qualifications can begin their careers in similar positions in the workplace, men tend to advance faster, creating a gender promotion gap. When women are able to advance, they often find themselves barred from attaining access to the highest echelons of the company by the invisible barrier of the glass ceiling. Even in the so-called women's professions, such as nursing and teaching, men outpace women in advancement to positions of authority. Similar patterns exist among blue-collar professions, as women often are denied sufficient training for advancement in manual trades, pass over for promotion, or are subjected to extreme forms of sexual, racial, and gender harassment that result in women's attrition. These studies are part of the large body of scholarly research on gender and work finding that white and blue collar workplaces are characterized by gender segregation, with women concentrated in lower paying jobs with little room for advancement. So the study recognizes first and foremost that male-dominated professions and industries are a commonality, and that men maintain their privilege and quicker advancement into positions of power even within industries that are not male-dominated. So despite the claims that women are better at some things and men are better at others, the trends do not reflect this in such a way that we should ideally see such a thing as female-dominated industries. That simply doesn't exist. There are either industries where men do well or industries where men dominate. 
The article further outlines how trans men's experience is showcased to some degree a smoking gun for how the day-to-day -day differences between men and women are not a matter of biology or socialization, but of privilege. This repetition of well-worn gender ideologies naturalizes workplace gender inequality, making gender disparities and achievements appear to be offshoots of natural differences between men and women, rather than the products of dynamic gendering and gendered practices. These experiences also illustrate that masculinity is not a fixed character type that automatically commands privilege, but rather that the relationships between competing hegemonic and marginalized masculinities give men differing abilities to access gendered workplace advantages. Many of the respondents note that they can see clearly, once they become just one of the guys, that men succeed in the workplace at higher rates than women because of gender stereotypes that privilege masculinity, not because they have greater skill or ability. Illustrating the authority gap that exists between men and women workers, several of my interviewees reported receiving more respect for their thoughts and opinions post-transition. Trans men also report a positive change in the evaluation of their abilities and competencies after transition. Respondents described situations of being ignored, passed over, purposefully put in harm's way, and assumed to be incompetent when they were working as women. However, these same individuals, as men, find themselves with more authority and with their ideas, abilities, and attributes evaluated more positively in the workforce. According to the trans men I interviewed, an increase in recognition for hard work was one of the positive changes associated with working as a man. Trans men can find themselves gaining an authority, respect, and reward in the workplace post-transition. Several trans men who are stealth also reported a sense that transition had brought with it economic opportunities that would not have been available to them as women, particularly as masculine women. These quotes paint a very clear picture that trans men receive benefits in terms of recognition, respect, authority, and economics for being perceived as men regardless if they've had a significant change in personality and skill or not. Simply being a man is enough for them to receive benefits, though the study admits that this is not an immediate thing. So what does the study have to say about why this is? They bring forth two theories, human capital theory and gender socialization theory. Theories that argue that men either are naturally the most fit for certain jobs or that we're socialized in such a way that men and women seek out certain jobs according to gender norms. Neither of these things are adequate explanations. And the article brings up a third theory, gendered organization theory. Gendered organization theory argues that what is missing from both human capital theory and gender socialization theory is the way in which men's advantages in the workplace are maintained and reproduced in gender expectations that are embedded in organizations and in interactions between employers, employees, and coworkers. The normalization of these disparities as natural differences obscures the actual operation of men's advantages. Finally, men's advantages in the workplace are not a function of simply one process, but rather a complex interplay between many factors, such as gender differences in workplace performance evaluation, gendered beliefs about men's and women's skills and abilities, and differences between family and child care obligations of men and women workers. A large body of evidence shows that the performance of workers is evaluated differently depending on gender. Men, particularly white men, are viewed as more competent than women workers. When men succeed, their success is seen as stemming from their abilities, while women's success is often attributed to luck. Men are rewarded more than women for offering ideas and opinions and for taking on leadership roles in group settings. Sociological studies have documented that the workplace is not a gender-neutral site that equitably rewards workers based on their individual merits. Rather, it is a central site for the creation and reproduction of gender differences and gender inequality. Men receive greater workplace advantages than women because of cultural beliefs that associate masculinity with authority, prestige, and instrumentality, characteristics often used to describe ideal leaders and managers. Stereotypes about femininity as expressive and emotional, on the other hand, disadvantage women, as they are assumed to be less capable and less likely to succeed than men with equal or often lesser qualifications. 
These cultural beliefs about gender difference are embedded in workplace structures and interactions. As workers and employers bring gender stereotypes with them to the workplace and, in turn, use these stereotypes to make decisions about hiring, promotions, and rewards. This cultural reproduction of gendered workplace disparities is difficult to disrupt, however, as it operates on the level of ideology and thus is rendered invisible. So to summarize all that, men are automatically seen as more skilled and more fit for jobs, especially higher levels of jobs, and are given better positions in the workplace regardless of if they're more qualified than women or not, which they often aren't. When women do anything right, negative stereotyping dismisses it as they got lucky, and the stereotyping of women as less capable leads to less promotions and less pay. If this sounds like kindergarten stuff, it's because it kind of is. The term for the theory behind this is symbolic interactionism, which is a theory that asserts that the day-to-day -day interactions between people set up shared meanings that then help to construct the social order. Gender inequality is very prominent in many fields, including in gaming, but this isn't the result of some sort of natural order. Rather, it's the result of a constructed order that maintains the illusion that men are simply more attuned or more valuable to the industry. What this means is that stereotypes about men and women, like the kind we see gaming culture, leads to more barriers to entry for women to become a part of the industry, which leads to more men helming the industry, which leads to further reproduction of gender inequality within the industry. This this isn't a static hierarchy that's established and then stays there. Rather, it's one that is continually reproduced as new people get hired and new people get promoted. Going back to the kaleidoscope of gender, the first reading, Gender as a Social Structure, by Barbara J. Risman, tries to argue in favor of conceptualizing gender as a social structure, and specifically talks about the gendered organizations of social structures and how they become gendered. As long as women and men see themselves as different kinds of people, then women will be unlikely to compare their life options to those of men. Therein lies the power of gender. In a world where sexual anatomy is used to dichotomize human beings into types, the differentiation itself diffuses both claims to and expectations for gender equality. The social structure is not experienced as oppressive if men and women do not see themselves as similarly situated. Status expectations create a cognitive bias toward privileging those of already high status. What produces status distinction, however, is culturally and historically variable. Thus, cognitive bias is one of the causal mechanisms that help to explain the reproduction of gender and race inequality in everyday life. These quotes demonstrate that the status quo of gender as a social structure is one in which we're all taught to differentiate men from women in an essentialized way. The term for this is othering, and I'll discuss othering in much more detail in a later part of this series. Because we're taught to see innate differences between men and women, the stereotypes we use to convey this become ingrained in how we think, which causes us to enact the stereotypes in our day-to-day -day life. This is how gender organization theory operates, under the assumption that our everyday interactions actions help to reproduce inequality. In reading 15, Gender and Power, by Maria Alexander Lepowski, Maria discusses this from a more top-down perspective. If they are congruent, ideology and practice reinforce one another, and if multiple levels of ideology are in accord, social forms are more likely to remain unchallenged and fundamentally unchanged. Where levels of ideology or ideology and practice are at odds, the circumstances of social life are more likely to be challenged by those who seek a reordering of social privileges justified according to an alternative interpretation of ideology. When social life embodies these kinds of contradictions, the categories of people in power, aristocrats, the rich, men, spend a great deal of energy maintaining their power. They protect their material resources, subdue the disenfranchised with public or private violence, coercion, and, rep and repression, and try to control public and private expressions of ideologies of political and religious power. What she means here is that when subordinate groups, such as women, become dissatisfied with their position within the status quo, people with more systemic power will be likely to do anything they can in order to prevent the status quo from changing and risk losing their position. This means that men who fear the influence of women will squash women's ability to gain any traction by any means they can. Another study, Generic Processes in the Reproduction of Inequality, covers what subordinate groups do when under the thumb of those in power. Dropping out is another response to inequality that might, though need not always, reproduce it. Individual dropping out, 
uh, out of school, out of the corporate rat race, out of political involvement is part of what we are referring to. Certainly the withdrawal of participation by people who are fed up with powerlessness and disrespect has the effect of allowing things to go on as they are. So what exactly makes an industry male dominated? I wish I could say it's simple, but it's actually very convoluted. The shortest answer I can provide, apart from reading volumes of studies on the manor, is to say that gender inequality exists within our society, and cultural stereotypes about men and women frame our collective mindsets to automatically view men as better for certain jobs than women. And this causes men to have more power within workplaces, which causes a cycle of reproducing the patterns of privileging men at the expense of women in these industries until these women eventually have to live under much worse circumstances within the field or just drop out entirely. I would argue that with the shift in computer science in the 1980s, becoming stereotyped as a masculine hobby and later, later a masculine profession, men came to, over a few decades, grow to dominate the field by sometimes deliberately and sometimes subconsciously pushing women out of the field. This was allowed to happen simply because our collective cultural biases prevent systemic measures from being taken to mitigate these issues. Simply put, the gaming industry is a male-dominated space because men feel threatened by the presence of women, so they use systemic privilege to weed women out of the field or keep them in low-level positions. This is my hypothesis, and I accept that it's conjecture, but because I don't have first-hand knowledge of the gaming industry or its history, but I'd love to hear first-hand accounts on the matter. So for the sake of a future video, if you're a part of the gaming industry, especially working for AAA developers, and especially if you're a woman, and you have insight, feel free con to contact me, and I can ask questions to help better understand the actual experiences of those in the gaming industry. With that, in part three, let's turn to what fans of gaming have to say.